I wrote this document a week ago, and it's somewhat lengthy, so in order to make it accessible, since no one reads these days, uh, I figured an audio version would be useful. You can have this open in another tab, I will point out when there is a graphic on screen, and I'll describe it to the best of my ability. Uh, all good? Nice. A Treatise on Class Specting by Ouroborista, ouroborista.neocities.org, that's me, with the indispensable help of Gentle Anachronist and Ubiquitarian Ideodect. I once gave a YouTube lecture about class specting. You may have seen it, and if so, I apologize. The piece was woefully inadequate, as is clearly demonstrated by the fact that this system still haunts my mind at the time of this writing. Time to finally put it to rest. Why should I trust this document? You shouldn't. I am but one voice in the canon, and while I have been singing this tune for a while now, the same is undoubtedly true for many of the other analysts. My aim is to offer you my toolbox, and you may take whatever instruments you please from it. There is no official truth, so the goal can't be being right. Rather, it is to assemble a system that satisfies you. Class specting, as a typology, is unique, in that it needs to be reverse-engineered as opposed to merely understood. What we have to go on are the known titles of known characters, as well as partially contradictory in-universe analyses by largely unreliable narrators. This presents an issue. Many have latched onto these description fragments because they tell rather simple, compelling stories, but in doing so, the system they construct often fails to actually explain the titles of known characters. In-universe, there is a disagreement as to whether class specs constitute a description, an aspiration, or a challenge to the wielder, so many have chosen the latter two and concluded that characters who do not seem to fit their class spec have simply failed at their quest, or have yet to embark on the relevant character arc. This to me is unsatisfying. The title is almost certainly a combination of the three factors, but even a failed arc should be recognisable. We should see the path they did not take, or the scars of a challenge befitting of their title, even when the player does not embody it in their current state, as is often the case with inversion. If such hints aren't given, it seems like a cop-out in order to maintain a faulty analysis. A proper system of class specting should clearly identify every known character as a product of their title, in one way or another. The in-universe interpretations of stories will often aid in this, but they are a secondary criterion, oft misinterpreted symbols. We should take a page out of Rose's book. Men have crafted many stories that are bullshit out of symbols risen from the abyss of consciousness without necessarily knowing what the fuck they were doing or saying, as they floundered around for some truth. But in spite of themselves, they would for however briefly cross through a ray of light regardless. Because of the symbols, Dave. The symbols hold all the power. If you don't recall the context of this scene, and are thus wondering about the square brackets, this was originally drunk typed, which doesn't make the sentiment any less valid. What is an aspect? Aspects are odd in comparison to other typologies because they tell us very little about the character of a character. Rather, they tell us how someone sees reality, which parts they primarily interact with, and which parts they tend to affect. Aspects are the topics to which the modes of the classes are applied. The Trinity. There are three ways of understanding aspects, and ideally they should all be born in mind simultaneously. They are an aesthetic domain of interconnected themes and symbols, aspect as domain, figurative, not literal, eldritch nature gods, aspect as force, the fundamental building blocks in terms of which someone understands reality, aspect as material. Hey, look, it's exactly like the other thing. And then there's a little, a little trinity, uh, you know, like the god one, um, with aspect in the center, and aspect is domain, aspect is material, aspect is force, and vice versa. But force is not material, material is not domain, and domain is not force, and vice versa. I will refer to people as aspect-bound, as opposed to aspect players, or heroes of aspect, not just because these sound silly, but primarily because they only reflect one branch of the trinity respectively. Hero of frames the aspect as entity force in favour of which someone acts. Hero of country, or such, is invoked. 
Player, meanwhile, is the purely mechanistic framing of material, someone who uses the aspect and exploits the dynamics. Bound, on the other hand, is ambiguous. It can be bound by, of aspect as force, the bound to, of aspect as domain, and the bound with, enmeshed crosshatch, of the aspect as material. Domain. The domain is the game you are playing, the things you care about. Class determines how one interacts with the world, but the domain delineates which parts one primarily interacts with. People of the same aspect often share interests and obsessions, stylistic markers and aesthetics, because they lie in their shared domain, the themes and activities around which they are at home and which they tend to gravitate toward, the symbolic and conceptual cohort which the aspect keeps as it signifies. Force. In Homestuck, the aspects may genuinely have wills of their own, but in reality they probably do not. Still, it is often useful to see them as active forces or gods of sorts, especially when it comes to phrasings like serving one's aspect. An understanding of cybernetics is useful but not required when it comes to the idea of inorganic desire. Aspects aren't sentient agents, they don't want anything, but neither does a plant want to be pollinated. Still, we feel like the insect serves the plant in some way when it carries its pollen, because it leads to the plant making more of itself. We anthropomorphize self-perpetuating cybernetic processes as teleological, as an intentional act towards some goal which the thing in question doesn't really have. When something successfully makes more of itself, then we think it wants to make more of itself. When a void bound makes the world more voidy, or a hope bound makes the world more hopey, we can read this too as them serving their master, like the insects serve the plant, even though everything is happening entirely without external influence, simply because the parties involved are the way they are. Call it ideals if you want to make it sound more respectable, but that rings a bit too purely optimistic. The ideals of the aspect, which it doesn't actually have, of course, aren't necessarily the ideals of the player. This is most obvious with destroyer classes, god slayers of sorts, but even a mage might see their force as a rather cruel entity and seek to curtail its influence. The concept of force is relevant whenever a person deliberately changes reality with regards to the themes associated with an aspect, aiding, cooperating with, struggling against, or outright fighting a god that isn't there. Material Aspect as material is the currency of the mind, the universal equivalent, the coloured lens through which one sees the world. Even for subjects outside of the domain, your aspect will be your go-to analytical tool. A heartbound will see everything in terms of personalities and identities, emotion and authenticity, at least to some degree. They can apply different approaches, and usually will to some extent, but they can't unsee this one, because every thought and sensation is already formulated in the thematic alphabet of their aspect. Transliteration isn't too difficult for most functional people, but you will always have seen the original language version first. When all you have is doom, then every problem looks like a prophecy. As material, the aspect constitutes the tools at our disposal, cognitive, but often also as their physical manifestations. The Aspects Breath Breath concerns itself with freedom and weightlessness, flexibility, spontaneity, and intuition. It is hard to tie down or put in a box. While not opposed to fighting for freedom, breath is closer to a living as though one were already free, not necessarily smashing the cage, but rather slipping through the bars along with the breeze. Breath manifests in humour and teamwork, in all that is light and easygoing. On the flip side, however, the breathbound can be evasive and aloof, detached, depersonalised and escapist. They might give too much way, and their easygoing weightlessness might cause them to simply not deal with reality when things get rough. Their free-flowing nature might leave them fickle and unreliable, they might retreat into fantasy when the world is suffocating to them, but breath is good at recovering from even the most dire of blows. It is difficult to leave permanent dents in the air, and few prisons are hermetically sealed. In and out, the world breathes its gentle stream of comings and goings. Life. Life is the aspect of growth, sprawl, accumulation, flourishing. Everything that was once a seed and will someday be a mighty tree, any sapling slowly breaking through asphalt from beneath. It concerns itself with care, nurturing, and literal life, of course. 
At the core of life lies an idea of naturalism, of a way things are supposed to be, a way that is natural. This might lead them to be cautious and conservative, not necessarily in the political sense. Hasty, drastic changes might kill the flower that has already grown so far. At their worst, the lifebound may be hesitant to the point of inertia. They might be hard-headed, overly protective, and unwilling to take risks. The lifebound may be confused when things don't go the way they consider to be natural, and they might try to restore order by any means necessary. Ideally, though, they have solid roots anchoring them to the earth, and strive towards the sun with every coming day, perhaps slowly, but always upward. Light. Light deals in exploration, knowledge, luck, and relevance. It is the electron microscope prying secrets from any crevice it can find, just as much as it is the spotlight drawing attention to that which cannot physically be ignored. The path of the aspect is well lit and certain. Luck here is the state of being consistently lucky or consistently unlucky. Light introduces certainty even in the places where chance should govern. When led astray, the hunger for knowledge or relevance can quickly turn to unhealthy obsession. The idea that everything is meaningful, everything makes sense, can lead to crisis when the lightbound finds no satisfying explanation behind their symbols. They may be entirely unable to deal with uncertainties, or the hunger for significance in the limelight might burn out their pupils. Curiosity might kill them like many a cat, or watering eyes which cannot close for even a second become their constant curse. At best, though, the light is a source of answers and a path towards genuine meaning. Time. Time is change, production, evolution, iteration, speed, but also artifacts, mementos, destruction, and death. It has always already passed, and it does not slow for anyone. Time might not be running out, but it is certainly running. Better keep pace. Here lies the domain of all those around whom days shatter into hours, minutes, seconds, and instants to be filled with something before they are gone forever. Stasis is impermissible, everything is in constant flux and there's always shit in need of doing. But that doesn't mean that you can't keep souvenirs, faded polaroids of what once was. Time houses those on the constant sprint forward just as much as the pens of nostalgics. A time-bound is likely to fall to dysfunction when they lose touch with the present moment, becoming trapped in past or future. Their relentless pace may turn them into miserable workaholics, or their constant metamorphoses may leave them unrecognizable to themselves or their friends. The next moment, though, always holds opportunities for radical reinvention. Time is a hot engine compressing reality to a pinpoint focus as it rushes towards it. Ideally, the time-bound functions like clockwork, always one step ahead of what the world throws at them. Heart. Heart's interest lies with the soul, with essence, the self and its reflection, identity and emotions, authenticity as well as inauthenticity. It straddles the space of all that is internal and subjective, of feelings, relationships and sensations. Heart cares about the why more than the what, motivations and desires. Above all, the aspect seeks to understand itself and others. It may find the answers it seeks in characters, in personas and roleplay, in all the shoes it can put itself in. The heartbound may detect imprints and outsourcings of identity even in the inanimate and fictional. Essence, too, may not just be those of people, but the platonic ideals of objects and situations, that which makes them themselves. When troubled, the heartbound might find themselves lost in their own head, unable to see the outside, falling through destructive cascades of self-hatred masquerading as self-reflection. They might mistake projecting their own feelings for empathy, and they might feel obligated to manage the emotions of everyone around them in addition to their own. When in the element, however, the heartbound is in touch with themselves and their friends. They know what role a certain situation calls for, and play it flawlessly, without ever confusing masks for their wearers. Rage. Rage gets a bad rap, in part due to the emotion after which it is named, but there are valid grounds for fury. Rage is the sworn enemy of the intolerable, of any rotten foundation that needs to be raised to the ground before something better can be built. Here lies burning, single-minded purpose, willing to sacrifice whatever it takes. Both the religious fanatic and the calculated, unflinching utilitarian find purchase with the aspect as unstoppable forces of their own tracks. It deals in nothing short of absolutes, brutal honesty or endless lies, and isn't satisfied with anything less. 
absolute freedom, absolute purity, absolute conviction, high contrasts and high intensities, madness and crystal insanity spiral around the ugly truths that rage is obsessed with. It is unsurprising, then, that theatre is another theme of the aspect, exaggerations of reality, emotions at boiling point. As creatures of the extreme, rage bounds can violently switch between modalities. They will be uncompromising, unyielding, and fanatically earth-scorching when they fly off the handle, but when kept in check, they are a radiant flame of righteous fury to be put against whatever threatens to harm them or their friends, unwilling to delude themselves into complacency for even a second. Blood. Blood concerns itself with groups, people, community, responsibility, hierarchy, and equality, society and its structures. Connection, trust, bonds, and charisma are themes of blood. It manifests in struggle and sacrifice, in the deliberate organization of persons. Blood loathes bullshit. It would rather have a good fight about something than leave the matter unresolved. It is the most down-to-earth and pragmatic of the aspects, dealing with people as they are in reality, turning strangers into friends and allies wherever they can. A warm and vital undercurrent pulsing through the organism of society, keeping it together. On the flip side, a bloodbound trying to strengthen their group might grow controlling. They may be self-sacrificing to the point of martyrdom when it is fully unnecessary, and they might be quick to see everything as a conflict, leading them to fight windmills. A healthy bloodbound, however, is soon dissuaded from such paths by those around them. They are phenomenal listeners and phenomenal leaders, capable of providing all the strength and warmth that is required of them, often simultaneously. Doom. Doom is the aspect of fate, prophecy, determinism, and narrative certainty. This too shall pass, reads the ancient engraving, already barely legible. The last line of the story has already been written. The ink dried, even if you haven't read it yet. The end is already in place, and all of our actions are no more than landmarks decorating the plummet towards it. Any dysfunctional apparatus of slowly decaying ruin is a monument to doom as a physical manifestation of memory, of all the pages that are already filled. When defeated by this monster at the end of the hallway, the doom-bound may fall to depression or anxiety, to existential defeatism. They may boggle vacantly at anyone waging futile battles in the face of heat death, but despair won't stop the inevitable either, so why bother being miserable? At their best, the Doombound are experts at coping in the best possible way. They never had any delusion that the tsunami would dissipate right before it hits them, so they already made their preparations or their peace. When they see that a battle is lost, they will accept defeat and move on to a game they can win, instead of sacrificing even more in a useless struggle. They know it will all decay eventually, the good, the bad, the everything, but they might as well enjoy the ride and laugh at all the little jokes inevitability throws their way. With a sardonic smile, but a smile nonetheless, the Doombound steps into the sunset. Void. Void deals in nothing. Well, that's a bit unsatisfying, isn't it? Void also deals in that, though it would never tell you so outright. But let's start over. Void deals in absence and mystery, in uncertainty, irrelevance, esoterica, and secrets. In the forgotten, the unknown, the pointless, the ephemeral, and the hidden. The aspect feels that a good question is ruined when it is answered, and that a beautiful code may be worth more than the message it encrypts. Losing yourself can be more interesting than finding yourself, and solid ground is hard to come by in the vast nothingness between celestial specks of light, so the void is for those who prefer floating, who distrust anything or to concrete in favour of a distant, anonymous whisper. Nothing is true, everything is permitted. The Voidbound may be quick to chase oblivion in substances and distractions, taking the idea that nothing matters in the grand scheme of things as an individual prescription of numbness. Their fascination with the obscure may make their own pursuits inconsequential and leave them with none who share their interests, though ideally their answer to the question, does it matter, could be, does it have to? The Voidbound may comfortably engage with uncertainty, where others can't, and a certain sense of insignificance may lend them an extraordinary capacity for stealth. Void can drift freely outside of relevance's gravity well, exploring the hidden corners of experience. Space. Space is breadth, diversity, creation and creativity, birth, motherhood, and preservation. 
but also loneliness and isolation amidst the vast cosmos. It can go anywhere, because it is already everywhere, and there is a tendency to get distracted or sidetracked by the sheer number of options at its disposal, but the journey is usually more important than the goal to them anyway. The canvas is literally endless, go ahead and draw something. Space has a penchant for lateral moves, for the random and unexpected, all the fascinating points of interest which dot its habitually all the way zoomed out bird's eye perspective. At their worst, the spacebound are unfocused and ineffectual, abandoning projects as soon as the next thing catches their eye. Their often strange and hyper-specific interests can make it difficult for them to relate to people, only deepening the spacebound's characteristic isolation. At best, though, the wide focus which the aspect affords lends them to become brilliant multitaskers and masters of navigating the outside of the metaphorical box. Mind Mind's interest lies with probabilities, choices, connections, predictions, causes and their effects, actions and their consequences, but also with games and the rules by which they operate as an artfully simplified case of the former. Lots of things will feel like games to the mind bound, and they'll make sure to play them well, following the ever-splitting paths of causal relation into intraceability, and perhaps a bit further. They don't need to know why you do something, only how likely it is that you would. Rule breaking can be quite troublesome to the mind bound, since the card counting stops to work when someone shuffles additional jokers into their hand. In general, their greatest weakness can be overgeneralization and simplification. They'll skillfully break a system down to its basic mechanics, but fail to account for idiosyncrasy. Or they might just grow too attached to their personally constructed rule set and force others to play by it. Eventually, though, they'll learn that these missteps just cause them to lose an unnecessary amount. Once the framework is reassessed, the mind-bound are phenomenal disentanglers of complexity and helmsmen of consequence. Hope Hope is the aspect of belief, ideals, and dreams, of all that is fictional, utopian, or aspirational, of all the brilliant visions for what the world could be, and all the ways in which it might yet get there. Hope is occasionally accused of naivete, or excessive optimism, and unflinchingly takes these as compliments. Once one loses hope that things might yet be salvaged or abandons trust in their group's ability to make it so, what would even be the point? Lofty idealism might not get you anywhere by itself, but all is lost without it. The hope-bound can easily descend to a state of shutting their eyes firmly and simply insisting that everything will turn out fine somehow. They might abandon reality or forsake pragmatism in pursuit of a gleaming vision, but in the end, the strength of one's belief means nothing if one won't act on it. A well-adjusted hope-bound will fake it till they make it, getting one step closer to the light with every step. Their outstretched hand isn't rose-tinted folly, it's a promise. The Wheel and Its Symmetries You know the wheel if you have spent any time in these circles. It looks like this. Then you see the aspect wheel, as um, presented by the Extended Zodiac. In case you need a refresher, and while I have my gripes with the Extended Zodiac as a quiz, it takes your relationship with your aspect to be cooperative, resolved, and permeating, which isn't the case for everyone, and especially not for some classes, I believe in the wheel, and I believe in much of what the Extended Zodiac has to say about the aspects. Making a quiz for class specting is simply hard. I don't think I could do it, and I wouldn't want to if I could, because the goal is to understand, not to have some label assigned to you by an indifferent algorithm. If that's your thing, you can get more than enough of it literally everywhere else in this hell world. Where was I? Right. Symmetries. Opposites. Strangely enough, the aspects often have quite a bit in common with their inverse, and for precisely that reason. They share a spectrum, even though they stand on opposite sides of it. They have the same topic. Hot and apple don't share much ground, but hot and cold do. They're talking about the same thing. This is usually most apparent in the domain, which often bears a significant overlap with that of its inverse. It is impossible to deal with the concept of justice without also dealing with the concept of injustice. Is the glass half empty or half full? Is injustice merely the absence of justice, or is justice merely the absence of injustice? Light and void both cluster around mysteries and the unexplored. They share a significant chunk of domain, but at the end of the day, the void bound cares about the question and the light bound about the answer. Light looks at the unknown in a Star Trek way, and Void in a Lovecraft way. 
Life and Doom are similarly cued into the way of the world and of nature. They intuitively understand that some things are much bigger than them, and they know how the story goes. But Life frames it in terms of the first few pages, the development, and Doom in terms of the last, the inevitable decay. Breath and Blood both care about people, about society, the social and the rules which bind us. But where breath takes and gives space, always on the lookout for individual freedom, blood locks hands firmly, draws others in, and tries to build their own, better system. Hope and Rage, on the other hand, distinctly don't know how the story goes, and they both take offence to the insinuation that there is such a thing. The future is what they make of it, it's just a question of whether the first and most important step is tearing down the bullshit or coming up with a utopian vision. Mind and heart are aspects which deal with the behaviours and actions of people, their impulse is to understand. But while mind cares about what you'll do, about getting the model to work, heart seeks to understand why you do it, tries to glimpse into people through their observable acts. It seeks the true nature at the core of something, while mind goes for all the optional bits which may be tweaked. Space and time are the fundamental aspect pair, their job is to make shit take place to create novelty. Between them, they span not only all of existence, but also the inseparable twin approaches of any creative project. Space goes for breadth, for ideas, for expansive, holistic input, while time goes for needlepoint focus and a rapid turnover ability to pull through on the prompt. There's a reason why these are the two aspects necessary for any successful session of Spurb. Intermission. But what if I'm actually a destroyer class of the opposite aspect? A footnote on the term destroyer class. In case this is your first exposure to class specting, and you don't know what destroyer classes, or even classes in general, will get there, are, I'm terribly sorry to additionally confuse you, but very briefly, there are classes whose interaction with their aspect is to destroy it and or to destroy through it. End of footnote. This is a very common question amongst those who are new to class specting, and it's a confusion which is even briefly addressed in the comic itself. After all, destruction of an aspect looks a whole lot like creation of the opposite aspect and vice versa. The destruction of heat is the creation of cool, but this class-wise ambiguity between opposites isn't actually as troubling as it may initially seem. All you need to resolve it are these two questions. Question 1. Do you seem like one of the destroyer classes? Stop rolling your eyes, yes this is obvious, but it's astounding how many people stumble at this ground level hurdle. The characteristics of the two destroyer classes aren't limited to the fact that they destroy their aspect in some way. First of all, there's the additional verbiage of destroys through their aspect, and secondly, the destroyer classes, like all classes, are character archetypes with their own distinctive personality traits and patterns of behaviour. Do you suit these? And question 2. What's your usual internal framing? Which is another way of asking, what about the material? Destroyer class inversion pretty much exclusively affects domain and force, which aesthetics surround you, and which master do you appear to serve. So, taking a closer look at material is an excellent litmus test. Yes, Aridon is immensely rage-coded and destroys hope at every step of the way, but if we take a look at the lens, the way through which he conceptualizes everything in the world, it practically reeks of hope. It's all just dreams, hero fantasies, and gleaming visions for a better future which in his case is horrifying, genocidal, and just generally despicable, but we're trying to look at the fascist disaster twink from the inside here, so uh, roll with it. Do you perceive void as the absence of light, or light as the absence of void? Horizontal pairs. Do you still remember what the wheel, TM, looks like? Good. Time and space, as the two foundational, essential aspects, constitute its poles, and, in a certain sense, all the other aspects can be read as specific implementations of time or space in relation to a shared concept, depending on which hemisphere, or technically hemicycle, they occupy. A pair of horizontal twins will represent a space take and a time take on a common subject matter. The closer to the poles, the stronger. The shared subject matter of time and space is all of existence proper, which is why they are the basic case. Time E aspects are active, acting, seeking, confronting, specific, and direct, while space E aspects are passive, being, analyzing, compromising, holistic, and indirect. 
Time is the most timey, and space the most spacey, but what do these specific themes look like? Hope and life share the theme of beginnings and growth. They both stand perpetually at the first day of a better world, but hope takes the space approach to this concept, planning, imagining, inventing, hashing out the big picture first, while life dives in by just planting a few seeds and seeing what becomes of them, instantiating the conditions of growth and charging ahead with their work, as is the way of time. Mind and light share the theme of knowledge and objectivity. They are disseminators of all the information reality has to offer, but mind takes the space approach of laterally reaching out at all the data which is already at their disposal, all the patterns they can analyze and simplify to reach probabilistic conclusions, while light takes the active approach of time, setting sail to discover all that which they don't already know, finding truth and meaning directly as opposed to inferring it. Light is fittingly frustrated with probabilities. Things are either true, or they are not. Void and Heart share the theme of subjectivity and feeling. Void gets there via space. It looks at the unfathomable complexity of reality, sees that it can't really know anything, and asks, okay, but what does it feel like, instead? It accepts fuzzy, idiosyncratic ambiguity because it doesn't believe in a fact of the matter. Spacey, holistic subjectivity. Heart also arrives at a focus on the personal and subjective, but it gets there from the time side. It seeks the pinpoint focus, the awareness left over once you subtract everything peripheral, the self. The things which matter in any one moment do seem to relate to people and emotions a lot. Identity is the most immediate tool it can work with. Timey, specific subjectivity. Doom and Rage share the theme of finality and decay. They are the twin crumbling pillars of an obsoleted paradigm, but Doom takes the indirect, passive, and zoomed out view that it's all gonna come down either way. It makes preparations and watches reality take its course, as foretold and as always. Rage, on the other hand, is active and confrontational. It will make itself an agent of the destruction to come. Rage asks what needs to end and gets to work ending it, picking a specific project and lifting the sledgehammer. Breath and Blood Breath and Blood have no horizontal twins. They are exactly as spacey as they are timey, which is interesting when you consider that Blood and Breath are the team aspects. Who else would be more cut out to be the mediator in a world where every successful group has a time bound and a space bound? Vertical Pairs These are a bit more tenuous than the horizontal twins, which is to be expected since time and space are the true poles around which the wheel is oriented. Still, Breath and Blood are strongly framed as pseudo-poles of sorts. The two most relevant sessions have a Breath Bound and a Blood Bound as the leader respectively, and the aspects are positioned at the top and bottom of the wheel's official layout. The Upper Hemicycle handles the ideal, abstract, divine, and optimistic, while the Lower Hemicycle handles the concrete, material, human, and pessimistic. We can play the same game as last time, refer to these attribute clusters as breathy and bloody, and look for common themes between vertical pairs, such that one is a breath analog and one is a blood analog. Light and Heart share the theme of meaning. They both believe in teleological reasons and really existing significances of the world they inhabit. For one, these are the concrete, human motivations of people, the genuinely existing souls at the heart of reality, while for the other it's an abstract, almost divine, true meaning and relevance in the external world. Symbols pointing towards genuine cosmic truth upon which light may be shown. Life and Rage are both interested in the status quo, the present, the way things are. But while life, breathily, idealistically, optimistically, tries to stabilize their little bubble of world, supply it with fertilizer and water, and see to it that it prospers, Rage takes one good, bloody, concrete, pessimistic look at the way things are, and says, well absolutely fuck this shit, not so gently with a chainsaw. Mind and Void share the theme of coincidence, chaotic attractors, and lack of teleological meaning. Things aren't the result of a plan, but the outcome of a complex, uncaring rule set. Mind uses this assumption to abstract an idealized system of rules from observable patterns, and assigns probabilities. While Void takes this to mean that on a moment-to-moment -moment level, nothing is certain, that there is no concrete, objective truth, and that it therefore might as well build its own. Hope and Doom share the theme of that which is to come, the future and the light, or lack thereof, at the end of the tunnel. 
For hope, these are abstract, idealistic, and most of all optimistic visions for what the future might hold, whereas for doom it is a bleak, concrete prophecy of material demise already etched into the structure of reality. Entropy always increases. But is there more? Like, surely by this point we can draw all the axes, all of them, and find parallels between the new pairs they produce. The answer is almost surely yes, some people even theorize about three aspect symmetries and the likes, and while there are definitely a bunch of cool, interesting patterns to be found there, they are almost certainly accidental. I have never found a satisfying, consistent pattern which links twins in relation to the other axes, even though there are perfunctory similarities aplenty. If you find something, feel free to tell me about it, but I do want to get to the classes eventually. So I'll leave all additional aspect patterns as an exercise to the reader. What is a class? Classes are two things. On the one hand, they are character archetypes, figures plucked from the mythology of life. Or, to put it a different way, your class is the role you play in the story. Where aspect is deducible from interests, framings, and ways of thinking about the world, class relates to patterns of behavior and personality clusters, the sort of person you are. Wielders of the same class will seem much more similar to each other than wielders of the same aspect. They will, however, speak different languages and act upon different thematic fields. On the other hand, class determines the way in which one relates to their aspect. This relation is often referred to as the verbiage of the class. Specifically, class is the mode which is applied to the domain, force, material of the aspect. One who steals life is quite different from one who serves it. To simplify it even further, let's pretend that fire is an aspect. An arsonist and a firefighter would both be firebound. The firefighter is antagonistic towards the force of their aspect, but they are nonetheless enmeshed with the material and they occupy the domain. Other substances, water, CO2, ammonium phosphate, etc., are used pragmatically as a means of dealing with fire, but they aren't themselves the point. Being bound by an aspect doesn't mean that you need to like it. Hate is a strong bond, as the comic likes to remind us. All the different ways in which you could engage with these concepts are within the purview of class. Verbiage always comes in two flavors. One who does X to their aspect, and one who does X through their aspect. Does X is a similar verb in both cases, and every class does both to some extent, though individual people might lean one way or another. Another way of putting this would be that they affect their aspect in a certain way using various tools to do so, and affect the world in a certain way using their aspect as a tool to do so. The mode stays constant across both, which is to say that the archetype, known as class, encompasses both. There is an ongoing and deeply tedious debate about whether some classes are gender exclusive, which is at some point claimed by a character in Universe who is also wrong about other game mechanics. The problem is this, if classes are archetypes and or modes of interacting with the aspect, which is widely agreed upon, then they can't be gender exclusive because there are no gender exclusive personalities or patterns of behavior. If you think there are, then you're kind of a piece of shit. <laughs> if class is assigned by the game in a restrictive manner, which is to say, not in accordance with actual personality, then it is a useless tool for analysis and we shouldn't even be talking about it. I prefer to believe that there is something actually useful here, so I won't tell people what modes of behavior they can or can't exhibit based on how they identify. This isn't to say that there can't be gender bias to the classes, some modes of interacting with reality are certainly gender coded, and we would expect unequal representation in many of them. All clear? Good. This is really all there is to say on the matter. The classes. Witch. The witch alters or bends their aspect, and alters or bends through their aspect. They change their aspect with the goal of breaking it, finding strategic exploits, while simultaneously locating strategic exploits in the social world with the help of their aspect. The witch will find the most harmful facets of their force and neuter them for the sake of themselves and their friends. This tendency to simply mess with established structure often turns them into outsiders, though. A lot of the things witches end up breaking are social conventions. Note the historical mythological role of the witch as an appreciated other, someone who lives outside of the village and its structure in the woods, but who is nonetheless vital to its existence as a source of curses and medicine. 
The witch represents an escape path into the adjacent outside, and a pressure valve at the periphery. Examples of witches from popular media are Howl Pendragon, Howl's Moving Castle, Misato Katsuragi, Neon Genesis Evangelion, Joel Van Dyne, Infinite Jest, Ramsey Murdoch, Apathet Erased, and Utena Tenjo, Revolutionary Girl Utena. Sylph. The Sylph heals or mends their aspect, and heals or mends through their aspect. They seek to repair and restore that which they feel is broken in the world or in their domain. Sylphs are extraordinarily cerebral people, though they don't so much find detached interest in their observations as projects. Understanding the illness is to the Sylph only a pragmatic means of healing the patient. They have a good idea of how things should be working, and if reality doesn't match their prescription, then a problem is diagnosed and they make their quest to fix it. Though Sylphs can have a hard time understanding or accepting that others might disagree with their assessment of brokenness. They are profoundly meddlesome by nature, born puppet masters who prefer gentle encouragement over less elegant means. Though that same tendency can lead them to be quite passive-aggressive when they try to nudge matters in a certain direction which the Naji does not wish to go in. Examples of sylphs from popular media are Jill Stingray, VA11 Hall A, Valhalla the game, I still don't know how to pronounce it, Valhalla, Leon Stamatus, Greater Boston, Gainan, Star Trek, Albus Dumbledore, Harry Potter, and Avril and Condensa, Infinite Jest. Knight. The knight protects and fights for their aspect, and protects and fights through their aspect. They serve themselves and their team through its material and domain, weaponize it and wield it as a blade. A knight, more than most other classes, will see their work as a duty rather than as something they greatly enjoy doing. They do it because it needs to be done, and they're best for the job. Or at least they'll carry themselves as though this were their reason, keeping a gooey core well concealed. Much like their namesake, the knight tends to be protective, but also armoured, though more so emotionally than literally. They are steadfast and reliable, in part because they understand their conduct as a duty. They can seem unapproachable, as they stand in their chainmail, though they rarely are. A knight functions best when they know what to do, they need a task, and impotent uncertainty will drive them insane. Examples of knights from popular media are Cassandra, Tangled, Shizo Hewajima, Durarara, Undyne, Undertale, Batman, Batman, and Balas One, Twilight. Maid. The maid serves their aspect and serves through their aspect. Service can mean many things, and the maid is certainly versatile, but they will often find themselves in a position to set up the playing field, pre-acting more than reacting. They attempt to bring facets of their aspect into the world by any means necessary, and far from serving because they feel like they must, the maid holds a great deal of adoration for their aspect's force, even for the parts that others find of putting. The maid is fully bought in, or at least full of an easy fascination, which might occasionally make them seem strange. Socially, they can be every man of sorts, holding together heterogeneous groups, reaching at a hand when the others are taken. The maid does not need to be an example of their aspect, though they often will become one in their service. They are merely in love with it. Examples of maids from popular media are Limpopo, Walk Away, Data, Star Trek, Daenerys Targaryen, Game of Thrones, Spike Spiegel, Cowboy Bebop, and Mabel Pines, Gravity Falls. Page. The page becomes their aspect, and becomes a fully-fledged person through their aspect. They are not naturally attuned, nor are they born to the domain of power. They are a pupil, and their road to self-actualization leads through many a failure. On the plus side, this means that they will be better mentors once they do figure out their calling. Native speakers are often bad language teachers, and it's the same issue with those who never had to really learn their aspect. But the page did, so the power they wield at the end of their journey is enormous. The page starts from zero, and the path of attainment is perhaps hardest for them. Pages get a bad rap, because this often means that they'll lag some way behind their peers for a while, but they're picking up speed, and if they don't give up, pages are bound to overtake them. The one thing pages have in spades is potential. Examples of pages from popular media are Steven Universe, Steven Universe, Bobby Newmark, Neuromancer Trilogy, Usagi Tsukino, Sailor Moon, Christopher Moltisanti, The Sopranos, and Mamimi Samejima, FLCL. 
air. The air inherits their aspect and ascends through their aspect. They are the rightful heritor of its themes and therefore seem to have a sense of naturality about them. If one excludes the masterclasses, the air is the closest to being a perfect avatar for their aspect, fully cooperative and frictionless. An air rarely has to think about what it is they should do, to a point where they sometimes only realize that they went through a massive development after the fact. They rarely have an internal struggle with their aspect, though this doesn't mean that the air doesn't struggle. This makes them reliable and quick to respond, but it also means that they might be completely lost if they are cut off from their domain by external reality. Often, their arc is about coming to terms with the power they are bestowed, or possibly realizing that they even have it to begin with. Examples of heirs from popular media are Luz Noceda, The Owl House, Paul Atreides, Dune, The Doctor, Doctor Who, Tiffany Aking, Discworld Saga, and Dimitri Stamatis, Greater Boston. I should add that the Doctor, while he's pretty much always an heir, um, changes aspect depending on the incarnation he's in. Most often time, but also sometimes um, light and hope are pretty common. Mage. The mage understands their aspect and understands through their aspect. Understanding isn't knowing, and neither is it awareness or even insight. It is the bone-deep comprehension you get when a concept is fused to your psyche. They are not obsessives, much less dispassionate researchers, but in many ways those who learned the hard way. Mages tend to have been burned by their aspect. Their tale is often tragic, but in the wake of such tragedy, they have grown, or will grow, wise. They often end up as mentors of the opaque, sagely variety. The mage will teach when to let go, so that others won't repeat their mistakes. However, they may well develop an act-as-I-say-not-as-I-do mindset. Where the heir has the least internal conflict with their aspect, the mage has the most. But a healthy mage will use this tension for good. They may never truly make peace, but they might achieve zen-like acceptance. Examples of mages from popular media are Uncle Iroh, Avatar The Last Airbender, Perry, the Far Meridian, Hal in Condenser, Infinite Jest, Beth Harmon, the Queen's Gambit, and Anthony Soprano, the Sopranos. Seer. The Seer knows their aspect and knows through their aspect. They are its great oracles, the aspect's analytic mouthpiece. They are prone to losing themselves, their own personhood quite often fully eclipsed by the latest interest. The idea of an info hazard is alien to a seer, and they are adept at bullshitting themselves in order to justify the price of certain knowledge. They are also adept at bullshitting others to seem far more put together than they truly are. The aesthetic of wisdom can be a valuable shield to the seer, rapidly approaching the deep end. Though on the surface they understand more than most, seers tend to be neurotic, always wanting to learn more and to learn at any cost. Once a seer believes that they know something, it is quite difficult to convince them of the opposite, and they are prone to believing that the only reason one might disagree with them is that they haven't explained their position thoroughly enough. Examples of seers from popular media are Jonathan Sims, The Magnus Archives, Asma Weatherwax, Discworld Saga, Heinrich Faust, Faust, Rayleigh, Lost at Sea, and Hubert etc. Walk away. Thief. The thief steals their aspect and steals through their aspect. While they are intense and often egocentric figures, thieves do not believe themselves deserving of anything for merely being who they are. They want to earn it. Treasure means little to the thief if getting it is too easy. They seek challenge, they seek rivals. The thief is never satisfied, their avarice is boundless because they don't actually care about the having part of theft, just about the taking. There is a constant hunger to the thief's conduct, and their self-worth is almost entirely constructed upon their ability to succeed at their latest goal, which can often result in social isolation for the thief. The subtleties of manipulation are more or less lost on this class. They will speak their mind and do as they please, even if doing so would obviously harm them, and they are unlikely to respect people who would not offer them the same treatment. Examples of thieves from popular media are Catra, Shira and the Prince of Power, Faye Valentine, Cowboy Bebop, Stan Pines, Gravity Falls, Cersei Lannister, Game of Thrones, and Kamina, Tengen Topper Garen Lagan. Rogue. The rogue redistributes their aspect and redistributes through their aspect. 
They steal, but not for stealing's sake, and not to prove something to themselves. The rogue steals in order to give. They steal for the greater good, though this is less a deeply held moral philosophy and more a gut feeling of what the right thing to do is at any given point. Rogues tend to be social creatures due to how altruistically minded they are, and they tend to spread themselves thin between all their little projects, sometimes losing track of their own needs. While they are excellent multitaskers, they may have trouble dedicating themselves to one big project, and more naturally handle five small ones simultaneously. The rogue is nothing if not sincere, there is rarely a motive deeper than genuine in the moment passion in sight, and they are profoundly allergic to boredom. The rogue has to do something. Examples of rogues from popular media are Masaomi Kida, Durarara, Reki, Haibana Renmei, Sophie Hatter, Howl's Moving Castle, William Riker, Star Trek, and Alice Cullen, Twilight. Prince. The prince destroys their aspect and destroys through their aspect. They are, contrary to popular belief, not necessarily evil, though princes tend to be difficult to handle due to their intensity. The prince considers themselves royalty, and when reality does not bend to their will, they will believe this to be the gravest of crimes. An incompetent prince will ineffectually seethe about this perceived injustice, but a competent prince will learn to bend the world to get what they are owed. To the prince there is no compromise, only complete failure and complete success. In between, the earth lies scorched, and they will not rest until they get what they are after. No hobby is dearer to the prince than picking hills to die on, though they would of course prefer if the other party did the dying. In terms of goals, they tend to be a rather big picture, and there is little they are unwilling to sacrifice. Examples of princes from popular media are Gregory House, House MD, Regina George, Mean Girls, Maximilien Robespierre, French Revolutionary, <laughs> Jeanne, Psycolonials, and Hades, Hadestown. Bard. The bard allows the destruction of their aspect and invites destruction through their aspect, which is a strange and not at all intuitive verbiage, though the same sentiment can be expressed by saying that the bard fucks with their aspect and fucks around through their aspect. No, this isn't a joke. The bard builds on an unstable foundation and smiles serenely when it cracks. They can be spectators or they can be actors depending on what mood strikes them, because the bard knows that fate is much bigger than them. The bard is therefore free to fuck around and do as they please, generally occupying the role of the jester, because they are acutely aware that reality owes them nothing, and that they don't owe it anything either. As such, they are generally agents of chaos, scarcely invested in any of the commonly agreed upon goals and metrics of success, only predictable in their unpredictability. Examples of bards from popular media are Oka Berintero, Steins Gate, Meursault, L'Etranger, Edelin Clawthorne, The Owl House, William Foster, Falling Down, and Dirk Gently, Dirk Gently Solistic Detective Agency. Class Symmetries. This is the part where I truly get myself in hot water, but to some extent everyone does. From up high it is posited that there are pairs of one active and one passive class who bear a similar verbiage. It is posited that the destroyer classes, prince and bard, the bandit classes, thief and rogue, and the master classes, lord and muse, footnote, I have skipped over the master classes for two reasons. The first is that they are, like gender locking, not useful to a character typology. It is stated that the master classes are bestowed upon players in nigh impossible sessions to even the odds, which is another way of saying that they have little to do with personality. <laughs> they are just a power up. The other reason is that they are classes with a sample size of one. I can't cross-reference examples to figure out which things are part of the Lord Muse archetype and which are idiosyncratic to Caliban or Calliope. The power-up idea isn't entirely useless though, I sometimes type god or force of nature type characters as a master class depending on their activity passivity to denote this very lack of conventional humanity. End of footnote. It was posited that the destroyer classes, prince and bard, the bandit classes, a thief and rogue, and the master classes, lord and muse, form such pairs, but beyond that it is anarchy. I will present my personal syzygies and explain why I believe them to be sensible, but be informed that we are departing from solid ground here. What is agreed upon is that these pairs do not in any way represent opposites of the type aspect pairs do. They are deeply similar, varying only along one axis, and their differences can be understood as a direct result of activity passivity. I posit these syzygies. 
Uh, okay, I will go in order of um, highest activity passivity to lowest activity passivity. We have the active lord and the passive muse under the command verbiage, the active prince and the passive bard under the destroy verbiage, the active witch and the passive sylph under the change verbiage, the active thief and the passive rogue under the steal verbiage, the active knight and the passive maid under the serve verbiage, uh, the active page and the passive heir under the become verbiage, and the active mage and the passive seer under the no verbiage. Other pairings which I have encountered with decent reasoning to support them are uh, the first one being active each time and the second one being passive each time, the maid and the sylph, the page and the knight, the witch and the heir, and the mage and the seer, the maid and the heir, the knight and the page, the witch and the sylph, the mage and the seer, the maid and the knight, the page and the heir, the sylph and the seer, the witch and the mage, and the maid and the seer, the knight and the page, the witch and the sylph, and the maid and the heir. Footnote. Looking at Homestuck's obsession with symmetry, it feels like both kid sessions should contain two active and two passive classes without occupying both parts of a pair respectively, which is a criterion only two of these, and mine, meet. This is a footnote because it's a boring, typologically irrelevant meta-argument instead of an argument from shared traits, but it does lend elegance to the syzygies. End of footnote. As you can see, the Mage Seer and Witch Sylph syzygies are quite uncontroversial, while Page Heir is uncommon, though not without precedent. My Knight Maid, on the other hand, is deeply heterodox. If you wish to tether your opinion to consensus, like a coward, take it with a grain of salt. Um, it does not actually say like a coward, in case you're not reading along on screen. Activity. Activity, of classes, is sometimes described as doing X for yourself versus doing X for others, though this doesn't even work for the well-known Prince Bard pair, and seems very much like a thief rogue specific effect of applying activity to the theft verbiage. The more useful shorthand is swimming with or against the flow, or, one given at another point in the comic, framing them as offensive or defensive classes in an RPG. A version I personally like is passive classes manipulate the battlefield while active classes go to fight on it. Engagement. Another pattern which may be found in the class chart comes into view when considering the aspect trinity. Different classes seem to have a habit of interfacing more strongly slash consciously with one branch of the system, or even to conceptualize of the aspect itself primarily in terms of only one branch amidst the force material domain trinary. The mechanism appears to me as follows. Each class syzygy engages with one trinary component consciously, asterisk, they are the terms in which they would naturally describe it, with one trinity component subconsciously, degree sign, this is the way in which the aspect holds to them a noticed sway over their actions, and with one component pragmatically, apostrophe, a tool which they are good at using, but which does not feel like a part of themselves. This yields six distinct combinations for the six pairs. It also just so happens that pairs with the same degree of activity passivity have reverse component orders, which is neat. So we have operators, the witch and the sylph, with conscious domain, subconscious material, and pragmatic force, servants, a knight and maid, with conscious force, subconscious domain, and pragmatic material, prophets, mage and seer, with conscious material, subconscious force, and pragmatic domain, Protégés, the page and the heir, with conscious domain, subconscious force, and pragmatic material. Bandits, the thief and the rogue, with conscious material, subconscious domain, and pragmatic force. And destroyers, prince and bard, with conscious force, subconscious material, and pragmatic domain. Think of the way in which prophets, conscious material, like Rose, Terezi, Solex, but also Cancri, insist upon the fact that their aspect suffuses all that there is. Everything is symbols and relevance, everything is games and decisions, everything is imminent demise, everything is interlocking social hierarchies. Whereas protégés, conscious domain, are much more likely to present their aspect in terms of its actual aesthetic substance, the things encompassed by its domain. John slash June focuses on the concrete markers of levity and freedom that are breath, and Jake on the concrete markers of fantasy and optimism that are hope, instead of so overtly jamming everything through the lens of their aspect. 
Note that this is another instance of me leaving solid ground. The Trinity is a novel framework and not classed in consensus. I do believe that the trifurcation itself is a relatively uncontroversial way of dividing up the different things classpects are used to describe, though others may use different terminology and or add branches. At this point I'm just seeing what I can do with the idea. Engagement hierarchies work surprisingly well though, and I for one find them quite elegant. Operators. Witches and sylphs change, manipulate, and transmute their aspect. They consciously deal in its real aesthetic content, which they wrangle into shape. For the active witch, this is a distorting, bending, and breaking. Think of Jade's literal breaking of space through the fourth wall, or Feth's breaking of death via dream bubbles, as well as the plan to redefine the nature of culling. The passive sylph, on the other hand, changes with the aim of healing or restoring something to the way it ought to be. They ally themselves with a perceived cosmic plan instead of fighting it. Arania trying to heal the dead timeline or reclaiming her rightful place of relevance as Mindfang, or Kanaya's auspicitisms and matriarch quest. A proclivity for, or outside imposed the need of being the adult, seems to be a theme amongst operators. They are the class of exasperated size. Sylphs will usually accept this role, and even get some joy out of it, while witches tend to do it grudgingly, hoping that their charge will grow up at some point. Servants. Knights and maids serve, aid, protect, and support their aspect. They explicitly or implicitly perceive their aspect as a force beyond them, be it a god or a set of principles and commitments. They perceive a direct alliance with their aspect. The active knight does their fucking job, wielding the material of the aspect like a blade, Karkat's disgruntled leadership, Dave's responsible timeline management, while the passive maid is more of a nanny to the eldritch deity at their side, readying its path and excitedly anticipating its moves, Aradia's death, Fangoldum, Jane's relation to Crocacorp. Servants are the bullshit managers, the cavalry, the people who do what needs doing, as a servant archetypically might. The knight does so as a matter of course, while the maid simply enjoys doing it. Prophets. Mages and seers know, understand, and comprehend their aspect. They glimpse through reality and recognize it as the motivating force behind literally everything, always to be found behind every curtain. The active mage both incorporates this insight into their self-concept, but also learns to oppose it to a certain degree. Solex's acceptance of doom and subsequent new lease on life, Mulan's relationship gurudom and advice to Horus to avoid being himself. While the passive seer conceptualizes the inside as external to themselves, inhabiting a more typical role of the scholar. Therese testing the results of Egbert's forked choice, Rose acting as an oracle to the narrative. Prophets share a theme of being in over their head. Like the blind oracles of old, insight into the ways of fate does not protect them from its designs. They tend to develop a crushing appreciation for how vast the thing they seek to understand is, and how little of it they can ever hope to see. Mages tend to spin this as a cautionary tale, while seers perceive it as a call to dive deeper. Protégés. Pages and heirs become their aspect, learn to direct it and grow familiar with the world through their aspect. They get to know the symbolic cohort of the domain they consciously inhabit. For the active page, this is a process of acquisition, a gradual path towards mastery. Tavros's eventual gathering up of the mental tools to stand up to Vriska and inspire the army. Jake's developing a capacity for real heroics. For the passive heir, on the other hand, it is a process of discovery, of unearthing and re-evaluating the contents of themselves and their environment. John slash June experiencing breathy unshackled freedom through the retcon, Equius discovering his own ineffectuality. Protégés seem to share a theme of being, um, well, protégés. They tend to attract and move through mentors more so than most. Pages here usually stick to a guide until they outgrow them, while heirs cycle through influences much more rapidly and grow less attached to any given one. Bandits. Thieves and rogues steal from and through their aspect. Like for the prophets, everything shrinks into the purview of one variable to be tracked, a universal equivalent in terms of which everything can be measured. For the active thief, the taking itself is relevant. It is relevant because it is a way of proving themselves and imposing themselves upon reality. Vriska's literally everything. Uh, if you are tantalized by the phrase Vriska's everything and want to know what number of good, valid, and perfectly morally justified things that entails, 
Uh, why don't you write after you're done watching this, of course, to the end, and then rewatch it so you get everything. Watch the hit video essay, Riska Cirque Did Nothing Wrong and Here's Why, by yours truly, which is actually fully edited and way more high effort than what you are currently listening to. Really, you made a bad choice. You should have, should have gone for the other one, you fool. Um, oh well. Uh, I forgive you. I forgive you, child. Um, that's the end of the shameless self-promo. Well, for now. At, at the end, there will be more shameless self-promo. <laughs> but you're safe. For now. For now. Vriska's literally everything, Mina's adoration of the Condas, and attempts to make her group more vicious. The path of Rogue is not swayed by challenge alone, but rather by what it is they can do with the things they steal in order to give. Roxy's conduct with the ring, Nepeter's RP sessions, stealing standard identity away from her friends in order to get them to play nice. Self-worth appears to be a theme amongst bandits, who are, in the symbolic sense, outlaws from the framework by whose metrics most derive validation. In rogues, this tends to be a more conventional lack of self-worth, often resulting in an impulse to please others in order to be validated externally, while thieves tend to erect a rather shallow front of self-aggrandizement in its place and hope to fake it till they make it. Destroyers Princes and bards destroy, corrupt, and undo their aspect. They perceive the force at their side either as an eldritch beast to be annihilated or a cataclysmic tool to be aimed by them. The act of prince lays waste like a vengeful general dictating the blast direction. Dirk's neurotic self-splintering, Arden's quest against the angels and Feffery, Curlos's messianic crusade. The passive bard, on the other hand, opens the floodgates as a matter of cause, and carries themselves unbothered by the consequences of their actions. Gamzee's worship of Lord English, Cronus's greasedom, and shirking of his destiny. Destroyers seem to share a theme of frustration, of a nagging dissatisfaction at the base of their brainstem. Bards tend to reshuffle their posture, try to get out of the way of the discomfort's origin, while princes lock their crosshairs on it and keep firing even if the target does not budge. Okay, but aren't they like moons? Well, aren't you observant? Yes, Luna's way. There are indeed not just 144 types in this system, but a whopping 288, since we have one attribute yet to apply. People of any class spec are either Durs, purple, or Prospect, yellow, aligned. While all the stuff we talked about before is a bit too subtle and complex for a quiz, this is a largely independent binary, and the extended zodiac is very good at accurately judging Luna's way. The alignment speaks to a sort of foundational disposition and a way of viewing the world. Natural or split sway does occur, though it is relatively rare. The leaning of a person may be subtle, and they do not have to match all criteria. It's a spectrum, and many prefer Durst leaning or Prospect leaning. Prospect. Those swayed by Prospect tend to have their focus outside of themselves, paying attentive mind to the world around them and measuring themselves by its standards. They know where they stand and this allows them to take their steps with confidence, intuiting where they need to go and swerving if something's in their way. Their default position is to trust people, though most aren't so naive as to be burned twice. This open and often easygoing approach tends to make them rather sociable. Their default temper tends to be relaxed, only reactively kicking into gear. While they are certainly capable of thinking things through all the way, they will usually consider this to be an unnecessary and often pointless effort. They would rather figure things out as they go, when they actually have all the facts to work with. Durst. Those swayed by Durst tend to have their focus firmly inside of themselves. They are masters of second-guessing their own actions and may lose the world out of sight at times. This world, incidentally, is to be measured by their standards, and they may just judge it insufficient. The children of Durs are rebellious and hard-headed. They would rather break through the obstacle, even if doing so is more effort. By default, they are distrustful and skeptical of most anything, and their faith must be hard won by those who seek it. Thus, they are more likely to be introverted, which only gives them more time to stew with their thoughts, drawing out plans and stratagems for situations which might never arise pre-acting rather than re-acting. Their default temper is to be ever so slightly on edge, and the things which happen to them tend to immediately be classified as either good or bad. Notes. Pattern recognition. 
The best way to learn class vecting is to look at characters with a common aspect, but especially with a common class, and figure out which vibes and affects they share. This is not a complete guide of what the classes entail, but rather it is meant to provide anchors, bright spots to lock onto and aid in navigation until the difficult to put into words subtleties come into view. The additional examples provided, and there are more at the end, are supposed to make that transition easier and allow the mental pattern matching to click into gear. The best way to get good at class vecting, as with everything, is to do class vecting, building upon your mental catalogue and honing your typological faculties. The true answer to what is a sylph is and should be I know one when I see one, so the purpose of this document is to give you a few lenses you might want to work with. You'll still have to look carefully, allow your focus to adjust, and at the start you might have to squint your eyes a little until the pattern resolves. Gender relics. There is a tendency in class vecting circles to type female princes as thieves and vice versa, as well as to type male maids as heirs and vice versa. Princes and thieves both tend to be rather intense personalities, though thieves are usually much more bombastic. They are both very active and have a shared, not entirely unwarranted reputation of being sort of dangerous. The difference between the two is vast, though, once you pick up on it. Thieves seek rivals and challenges, while princes are annoyed by them. A prince will take the helicopter ride to the top of the mountain when it is offered, because it is the pragmatic solution and they feel like they should be up there, they feel entitled to be up there. The thief will refuse, because they want to prove that they can climb the mountain. Maids and heirs aren't even all that similar, apart from the fact that they are relatively passive and have highly cooperative relationships with their aspect. I can't see the logic behind this one, so I have a hard time giving counter tools. A good first step is to look at John slash June and Jane again, and realise that they fill very different archetypes beyond their gender presentation. Maids will usually have an active veneration for the force of their aspect, heirs will usually not. Heirs have a profound air ha, of naturality and made for thisness about them when dealing in the domain of their aspect. Maids will usually not. Maids will seem like they have much more of a purpose driving them. Opposites. If they are truly opposite classes, then classes with inverse activity-passivity and reverse engagement hierarchies seem like they best fit the bill. This would yield the following pairs. Prince Sylph, Thief Maid, Page Seer, Mage Heir, Knight Rogue, Witch Bard. Pseudo-classes. It is commonly believed that people occasionally act out a class which is not their default. The most prevalent flavours of this are the unconscious imitation slash role-playing of a childhood influence, often apparent, the performance of a socially imposed role, and class inversion, which occurs when a person interacts with the twin of their normal aspect, which is relatively common for reasons we have previously discussed, but occurs especially in moments of intense emotional stress. The usual theory goes that they then also inhabit the active-passive twin class within their pair, this idea is occasionally useful, though I don't think it works for most characters. I like the following explanation for this phenomenon. People have a mode of interaction with every aspect, since in some situation they will have to interact with every aspect. People are usually only well versed in one or two secondary aspects, which lag far behind their default. When people are forced, due to intense emotional load or similar, into a regime of a non-native aspect, they may also assume a different class, which is their designated mode of interaction with that aspect. Which class this is, is idiosyncratic and may or may not represent the twin of their default class. Stability. Class specs seem to be highly stable. They are not unalterable, and sufficiently incisive life events or very long time spans can bring such a flip about. People are malleable, but Classpect seems to be astoundingly solid on the scale of a decade. If a change does occur, it usually does so by way of a pseudo-class, which had previously germinated in specific interactions, taking over. I think this is the longest script I have ever read in one sitting, and um, yeah, my throat is not liking it. Limitations. Who the fuck are these people slash characters, I hear you ask, as you boggle vacantly at the Classpect example chart on the following page of this document, and let me tell you, I tried, I really tried to limit myself to well-known figures, but on the quest for 144 genuinely good examples, anyone would have to scrape the bottom of the relevance barrel eventually, and I bear the additional handicap of simply not being super cued into popular media. Still, all of them should at least have wiki or tv tropes pages, so there's that. 
I would apologize for the inconvenience if you weren't so massively indebted to me. Jesus. I can't believe I left that sentence in. Cool. Some of the chosen examples aren't exactly role models, of course, but sharing a class fact with one of these figures does not mean that you can't be one. Any type has the potential for good and for evil, for success and for failure. My primary goal was to showcase characters and people who are both illustrative and at the very least interesting. I would personally be much more upset if I were represented by a boring figure than by a morally dubious one. Though, if you feel differently and suffered this fate, I am very sorry. Examples. Uh, I've tried reading this in one go before. Uh, I failed every time. Let's see if it works this time. We have Chise Hattery of the Magus Bride as the Dursite Page of Breath. Christopher Moltisanti of The Sopranos as the Dursite Page of Life. Bobby Newmark of the Neuromancer Trilogy as the Prospitan Page of Light. Naota Nandaba of FLCL as the Prospitan Page of Time. Steven Universe of Steven Universe as the Prospitan Page of Heart. Shinji Ikari of Neon Genesis Evangelion as the Dursite Page of Rage. Jacob Black of the Twilight Saga as the Prospitan Page of Blood. Mamimi Samajima of FLCL as the Dursite Page of Doom. Michael Tate of Greater Boston as the Dursite Page of Void. Kia Fiore of Thrilling Intent as the Prospitan Page of Space. Scott Pilgrim of Scott Pilgrim as the Prospitan Page of Mind. Usagi Tsukino of Sailor Moon as the Prospitan Page of Hope. Teo of Celeste as the Prospitan Heir of Breath. Ned Stark of Game of Thrones as the Prospitan Heir of Life. Tiffany Aching of the Discworld Saga as the Dursite Heir of Light. The Doctor of Doctor Who, at least most of the time, as the Prospitan Heir of Time. Mikado Ryugamine of Durara as the Dursite Heir of Heart. Howard Beale of Network as the Dursite Heir of Rage. Paul Atreides of Dune as the Dursite Heir of Blood. Molly Blindeff of Epithet Erased as the Prospitan Heir of Doom. Dimitris Tomatus of Greater Boston as the Prospitan Heir of Void. Luz Noceda of The Owl House as the Prospitan Heir of Space. L of Death Note as the Prospitan Heir of Mind. Orpheus of Hadestown as the Dursite Heir of Hope. Diogenes, the IRL philosopher, as the Prospitan Seer of Breath. Jane Austen, the IRL writer, as the Prospitan Seer of Life. Jonathan Sims, of the Magnus Archives, as the Dursite Seer of Light. Nick Land, philosopher, as the Dursite Seer of Time. Asterisk! I explicitly do not support, condone, or even tolerate this person's politics in any way. Absolutely fuck every single one of these guys. Plural, there will be more of these. Um, R.D. Lang, IRL Psychiatrist, as the Prospitan Seer of Heart. Jennifer Melfi, of The Sopranos, as the Prospitan Seer of Rage. Samuel Vimes, of The Discworld Saga, as the Dursite Seer of Blood. Anathema Device, of Good Omens, as the Prospitan Seer of Doom. Rayleigh Lost at Sea, as the Dursite Seer of Void. Heinrich Faust, of Faust, as the Prospitan Seer of Space. Esma Weatherwax, of the Discworld Saga, as the Dursite Seer of Mind. Hubert Etc., of Walk Away, as the Dursite Seer of Hope. Uncle Iroh, of Avatar The Last Airbender, as the Dursite Mage of Breath. Edward Cullen, of the Twilight Saga, as the Prospitan Mage of Life. Hal and Condenser, of Infinite Jest, as the Prospitan Mage of Light. Mark Fisher, the IRL Cultural Theorist, as the Dursite Mage of Time. Kiramiki of Valhalla, as the Prospitan Mage of Heart. Thomas Ligotti, the IRL writer, as the Dursite Mage of Rage. Anthony Soprano, of The Sopranos, as the Dursite Mage of Blood. Jet Black, of Cowboy Bebop, as the Prospitan Mage of Doom. H.P. Lovecraft, the IRL writer, as the Dursite Mage of Void. Asterisk. I explicitly do not support, condone, or even tolerate this person's politics in any way. Absolutely fuck every single one of these guys. <sighs> I, no one on this chart is explicitly condoned. A bunch of these people are kind of shitty, but the, the ones with the asterisks are... They're, they're the real deal. They're real bad. <laughs> they're real bad. <laughs> um, uh, where was I? Right. 
Perry, Hesperia of the Far Meridian, as the Prospitan Mage of Space, Beth Harmon of the Queen's Gambit as the Dursite Mage of Mind, Asgor of Undertale as the Prospitan Mage of Hope. Michel Foucault, the IRL philosopher, as the Dursite Self of Breath, Albus Dumbledore of Harry Potter as the Dursite Self of Life, Guinan of Star Trek as the Dursite Self of Light, Leon Stamatis of Greater Boston as the Prospitan Self of Time, Nana Osaki of Nana as the Dursite Self of Heart, Light Yagami of Death Note as the Dursite Self of Rage, Joculine of Psycholonials as the Prospitan Self of Blood, Death of Discworld, it says Discworld Saga everywhere else, it just says Discworld here, that's upsetting, fuck me, Death of the Discworld Saga as the Dursite Self of Doom, Jill Stingray of Valhalla as the Prospitan Self of Void, Lane Iwakura of Serial Experiments Lane as the Dursite Self of Space, Avril and Condenser of Infinite Jest as the Prospitan Self of Mind, Jean-Luc Picard of Star Trek as the Prospitan Self of Hope. Howl Pendragon of Howl's Moving Castle, both book and anime, as the Prospitan Witch of Breath. Persephone of Hades Town as the Dursite Witch of Life. Harry Suzumiya of The Melancholy of Harry Suzumiya as the Dursite Witch of Light. Case of the Neuromancer Trilogy as the Dursite Witch of Time. Disjointed of Walk Away as the Prospitan Witch of Heart. Perry Cox of Scrubs as the Prospitan Witch of Rage. Misato Katsuragi of Neon Genesis Evangelion as the Prospitan Witch of Blood. Karu of Neon Genesis Evangelion as the Dursite Witch of Doom. Joel Van Dyne of Infinite Jest as the Dursite Witch of Void. Ramsey Murdoch of Apathet Erased as the Dursite Witch of Space. Catherine Janeway of Star Trek as the Prospitan Witch of Mind. Utena Tenjo of Revolutionary Girl Utena as the Dursite Witch of Hope. Ashling of Thrilling Intent as the Dursite Maid of Breath. Toriel of Undertale as the Prospitan Maid of Life. Nicastomatus of Greater Boston as the Dursite Maid of Light. Limpopo of Walkaway as the Prospitan Maid of Time. Data of Star Trek as the Prospitan Maid of Heart. Daenerys Targaryen of Game of Thrones as the Prospitan Maid of Rage. Adora of Shira and the Princess of Power as the Prospitan Maid of Blood. Franz Kafka, the IRL writer, as the Dursite Maid of Doom. Spike Spiegel of Cowboy Bebop as the Dursite Maid of Void. Gilles Deleuze, the IRL philosopher, as the Prospitan Maid of Space. Percy King of Apathet Erased as the Prospitan Maid of Mind. Mabel Pines of Gravity Falls as the Prospitan Maid of Hope. Eurydice of Hades Town as the Prospitan Knight of Breath. Cassandra of Tangled as the Dursite Knight of Life. Dipper Pines of Gravity Falls as the Dursite Knight of Light. Ray Hino of Sailor Moon as the Prospitan Knight of Time. Ray Ayanami of Neon Genesis Evangelion as the Dursite Knight of Heart. Shizo Hewajima of Durara as the Prospitan Knight of Rage. Undyne of Undertale as the Prospitan Knight of Blood. Bella Swan of the Twilight Saga as the Dursite Knight of Doom. Bruce Wayne of Batman as the Dursite Knight of Void. Erika Karasawa of Durara as the Prospitan Knight of Space. The narrator of Alice Isn't Dead as the Prospitan Knight of Mind. Madeline of Celeste as the Dursite Knight of Hope. Heinrich Heine, the IRL poet, as the Prospitan Prince of Breath. Emily Bespin of Greater Boston as the Prospitan Prince of Life. Gregory House of House MD as the Dursite Prince of Light. Hades of Hades Town as the Prospitan Prince of Time. Dorian Gray of The Picture of Dorian Gray as the Dursite Prince of Heart. Jen of Psycholonials as the Dursite Prince of Rage. Regina George of Mean Girls as the Prospitan Prince of Blood. Jordan Peterson, the IR Psychologist, as the Prospitan Prince of Doom. Asterisk. I explicitly do not support, condone, or even tolerate this person's politics in any way. Absolutely fuck every single one of these guys. He was the last of these guys, though. Um, even though I'm kind of exasperatedly reading this, because it shouldn't even need saying, uh, don't interpret that as a sarcastic disavowal of any sort. I absolutely, actually fuck these guys. Tatsuhiro Sato of Welcome to the NHK as the Prospitan Prince of Void. 
James and Condenser of Infinite Jest as the Dursite Prince of Space, Isaiah Orihara of Dura Ra as the Dursite Prince of Mind, Maximilian Robespierre, the IRL French Revolutionary, as the Dursite Prince of Hope, Edelon Clawthorne of The Owl House as the Dursite Bard of Breath, William Foster of Falling Down as the Prospitan Bard of Life, Okabe Rintero of Steins Gate as the Prospitan Bard of Light. The Dude of the Great Lebowski as the Prospitan Bard of Time. Mursu of L'Etranger as the Dursite Bard of Heart. J.G. Ballard, the IRL writer, as the Dursite Bard of Rage. Aristophanes, the IRL playwright, as the Dursite Bard of Blood. Sans of Undertale as the Dursite Bard of... Bard of Undertale. <laughs> I was about to say Bard of Undertale. <laughs> I'm, I'm, st- I'm big stupid. <laughs> Sands of Undertale as the Dursite Bard of Doom. Marcus Valafi of Frilling Intent as the Prospitan Bard of Void. James Joyce of the IRL Writer as the Prospitan Bard of Space. Dirk Gently of Dirk Gently Solistic Detective Agency as the Prospitan Bard of Mind. Zeron Kierkegaard, the IRL Philosopher, as the Dursite Bard of Hope. Faye Valentine of Cowboy Bebop as the Dursite Thief of Breath. Cersei Lannister of Game of Thrones as the Prospitan Thief of Life. Asuka Langley Soyu of Neon Genesis Evangelion as the Prospitan Thief of Light. Diana Network of. Uh, Diana Network. Since Demiurge Diaries, I cannot unsay Diana Network. Diana of Network. <laughs> Surely I fucked that up at some other point. Okay, disregard. Don't care. Okay. Diana of Network as the Dursite Thief of Time. Haruhara Haruko of FLCL as the Dursite Thief of Heart. Princess Azula of Avatar the Last Airbender as the Prospitan Thief of Rage. Katra of Katra. Katra of Katra and the Shearers of. The Shearers of Power. <laughs> Fucking. <sighs> None of these words mean anything to me anymore. At some point, I think I said the Prospitan Durse of whatever. Yeah, oh yeah, the Prospitan Durse of Mage. Catra of Shiran the Princess of Power as the Dursite Thief of Blood. Thistle of Alice Isn't Dead as the Prospitan Thief of Doom. Stan Pines of Gravity Falls as the Dursite Thief of Void. Neil Caffrey of White Collar as the Dursite Thief of Space. Peter Baelish of Game of Thrones as the Dursite Thief of Mind. Kamina of Tenga Top and Garan Lagan as the Prospitan Thief of Hope. Natalie Redwater, Ice Weasel, of Walk Away as the Dursite Rogue of Breath. My fucking voice is going fast. Celtic Delson of Durarara as the Dursite Rogue of Life. Hunter S. Thompson, the IRL writer, as the Dursite Rogue of Light. Sophie Hatter of Howl's Moving Castle, the anime as well as the book, as the Prospitan Rogue of Time. William Riker of Star Trek as the Prospitan Rogue of Heart. Mallory of Greater Boston as the Dursite Rogue of Rage. Maso Mikida of Durarara as the Dursite Rogue of Blood. Reki of Haibana Renme as the Prospitan Rogue of Doom. Abby of Psycholonials as the Prospitan Rogue of Void. Charles Linza Coolidge of Greater Boston as the Dursite Rogue of Space. Alice Cullen of the Twilight Saga as the Dursite Rogue of Mind. Gregor Hartway of Thrilling Intent as the Prospitan Rogue of hope. Jesus, I hated every second of that. <laughs> um, epilogue. And so we find ourselves at the end of this journey, or at least at an exit. I hope that you, being still here, got something out of it, and that I, no longer being here, managed to put this little project to rest. If you have acquired an interest in my opinions about Homestuck along the road, why don't you watch this video essay in which I defend everyone's favourite device of heroin, Vriska Circuit. Or not, up to you, though I would be thankful. Best of luck, however you wish to proceed from here. Goodbye. Yeah, um, you can also buy my literal physical book, Sky Art, on Amazon. Um, and I can be paid to do pretty much anything. Uh, first and foremost, of course, writing, like fiction, non-fiction, comic scripts, video games, done that, been there, done that, um, backstories for your OCs, any, anything, anything, really. Um, you can also uh, pay me for bad drawings, or to read things, I guess, 
Um, just give me money. That, <laughs> yeah, that's the note I want to end this on. Give me money. <laughs> Bye.